Thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is someone who's going to share with us some fantastic tools and ideas of how we can transform the world by sharing a better story. Our guest today is Gail Larson, and she is a communications coach, speaker, and workshop leader. And She also helps originate such things as transformational events. She founded Real Speaking in 1991 to support her clients in mining the deep well of their life experience and self-expression to become powerful platform speakers. And today she's here to talk with us about her book, Transformational Speaking. If you want to change the world, tell a better story. Gail, I totally agree with that. <laughs> That's great. That's a good and, you way know, to start the <clears throat> You know, real proof in the pudding about that is when you look at the last presidential election cycle with Barack Obama and the speeches that he was giving, you know, were very inspirational. I mean, how many people didn't have a tear in their eye during his acceptance speech? And even beyond that, Daniel, would we even have known him if he hadn't made that incredible speech at the Democratic Convention in 2004? Most of us had never heard of him until then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. What was so special? What was the icing on the cake? Because, I mean, his speeches were so dynamic, you know, it was like he appealed to just about every emotion a person could have. Well, he definitely, what I would say is, in addition to being a very good speaker, and I've read a little bit about how he came to that, but mostly he told his story and he showed a better story that was possible for our country and our standing in the world. And people responded to that. We wanted hope. You know, yes, we can. You know, hope is an action plan. The whole thing really touched something that we want to believe is possible, especially in these challenging times. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us how you got started in uh, transformational speaking, if you will, because, you know, most people know that there are two things people fear the most, and that's death and then speaking in front of other people. (laughs) And it seems people would mostly prefer to die than talk in front of other people. (laughs) Well, I joke, I went to a the church service on the Day of the Dead, only in Santa Fe, where I was living at the time. <laughs> and I noticed that in Buddhism there are five fears. And public speaking was only number five. The first mm-hmm. one was fear of death. Second one, loss of livelihood. Third, loss of reputation. Fourth, fear of a supernatural event. Mm-hmm. And then speaking before a public assembly. So I, I thought, well, if you did... In a really one really bad speech, you could accomplish all five at once. <laughs> mm-hmm. So no wonder fear looms so large. And it certainly did for me. It took me beyond 50 to really get over it and to find my way to speak that was authentic and real and fun and meaningful. In 1981, I was the first woman to be named the Tennessee Small Business Man of the Year. And people wanted to hear from me. I was terrified. It was very scary to speak. But I became so enamored by the world of speaking that I ended up selling my business in Tennessee and moving to Arizona to be the CEO of the Worldwide Professional Association for people who make their money as speakers, the National Speakers Association. Mm So I learned a lot watching, and you know, fortunately I didn't have to speak. I was running their business organization and planning their conferences and so forth. But what I saw was that the best speakers didn't follow rules. Mm-hmm. They were uniquely themselves and proud of it and willing to put themselves out there in their way, which goes to my first principle of, of really getting into understanding how you can be a great speaker, which is be yourself, everyone else is taken. Mm -hmm. We want freshness and originality. Yeah, I know, Gail, that in your book you were talking about one story where there was uh, someone who was really excited about having you listen to someone speak. And uh, then afterwards you said, well, you know, technically what this person said was was good, but as far as a good speaker, I'm not so sure. Go ahead if you remember that yes, particular Yes, I story. do, because one of my colleagues was so excited about hearing me uh, 
having me hear one of her friends who was a speaker on health issues. Mm -hmm. And she actually was, everything technically was terrific. But when Joanne said to me, isn't she going to do great with this? I said, well, I doubt it. Mm -hmm. And it's because she did nothing original. She she did a very nice um, synopsis of what Deepak Chopra and Larry Dossie and Bernie Siegel have been telling us for years. Mm -hmm. And when people bring in a speaker... I mean, if they've got budget, they're going to bring in Larry Dossey and Deepak Chopra. Mm -hmm. And so there's not, for someone who's really using their speaking to wake people up to new ideas, there's not not much there for someone who has already heard the masters. Right. Now, when you talk about technically she was good, what do you specifically mean technically? What are some of the tech? technical things about public speaking that can be good things to have in place while you're developing that self-expression? You know, well, I would I would suggest that it's better to develop the self-expression and then look at the skills because okay. the truth is when we're authentic in our communicating and when we're with our friends, for example, we're not fearing our public speaking. And how do we move the best of who we are to the speaking platform without becoming someone else? That's the problem with techniques. Right. Once I work with a concept called not the comfort zone, but the home zone. I contend that most speaking coaches try to fix you, not try to find you. And I want to find you. I want to find who's under there that wants to stand up and be excited excited about what you have to say and say it in your way, which is undeniable. I call that the home zone. So it's really moving into your the heart of, of why you care about your stories and why you care about your message. And when we accomplish that, then there are a few techniques or skills. And they're very common. There's the pacing of a speech. I have found that the single most important skill for most people that transforms their style is to insert a period. Mm -hmm. You can listen to someone and they will go five minutes without, and, and, and every sentence will go together and then they'll go on to the next one and there's nothing to define it And it, as I'm speaking now. So when we stop, it alerts the audience that, Oh, okay, I can get in now. I wonder if that that pattern goes back to people having to compete for airspace in their families or something. <laughs> and if they stop for a minute, maybe they couldn't get, you know, never get Dinner back table, into the... mashed potato <laughs> conversation, exactly. <laughs> so, so that is the key one. Um, another is what I call verbal punctuation. It takes us out of the monotone of... Uh, where we're not emphasizing or putting in question marks or exclamation points. We want to have our speech be alive with with the punctuation that indicates where we assign importance. Mm-hmm. And then another one is tone of voice. Because when we're excited, we go up. Oh, this is great. It's such a beautiful day on Whidbey Island today. You wouldn't believe me if I said, I woke up this morning and I saw the sun shining, which doesn't happen often, and the mountains are out. You know, who cares? But hey, (laughs) the mountains are out. Only in the Northwest do we talk this way. (laughs) Right, Daniel? (laughs) Exactly. I know it reminds me of uh, an acquaintance that I have that when you meet with her, uh, she actually uh, sometimes hosts a radio show. And it's quite interesting because to talk with her in person, I think to myself, you're just not very exciting, <laughs> you know, and I wonder if that translates through radio and why perhaps your listening audience maybe is non-existent, uh, because it's very important to have energy to get people, you know, excited about listening to what it is that you have to say. Absolutely. Why? Otherwise, if you don't care and don't show it, why would we? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> sort of a bad luck schlepprock syndrome, if you will. You know, now it's interesting because in your book, and this is something that I've even uh, talked with uh, my own wife about, and that is your presence when you are there and you're, and you're given a speech. And this really goes for anything when you're in front of people. I said, 
there's a difference between how people connect with you when you project yourself to them versus you're standing there and like there's this wall and you don't want the eyes bearing down on you no matter how good you speak if you don't have that first element it just won't be as dynamic energetic or exciting now can you talk a little bit about that yeah you have to be present to have presence and normally when we're speaking if we're in, in fear or doubt or, oh, how am I going to do, or thinking about ourselves instead of the audience at that point, we're not present, so we can't have that dynamic connection. So going back to the home zone, the, the way I teach that I mentioned earlier, is, for example, if you're telling a story, you don't practice and rehearse it with every nuance. That is so phony. We can see it a mile away. It doesn't mean we don't tell the same story because people love stories. I mean, when we talk to kids, oh, tell me that one again, Auntie Gail, I hear from from my nieces. They like the same story, but we can't tell it the same way every time. So if we can move into reliving it and let our body inform us because it remembers everything, then we can be alive and dynamic in it, and it's fresh every time. And when we stop touching the original emotion that made that story important, it's yesterday's masterpiece. Mm -hmm. You cannot give it CPR. You know, you've got to, you've got to um, let it go and look for the next, see what story finds you. Now, as people are listening here to the Beyond 50 radio program and to you, Gail, and they're thinking, okay, I get out in front of people and I do speeches or I I speak to people about particular things, Uh, one element you might call technically important, but it may not be as important as people think, would be vocabulary. Now, I know that in your book you help cultivate words that are real specific to your experiences so that your speaking becomes more authentic? Well, I'm not quite... I might ask you to say a little bit more about that question, Daniel. Well, the idea is cultivating a vocabulary language instead of trying to pile on and add more words to what you know Mm -hmm. to come across as becoming, you know, some people will speak and they'll try to use these huge words, and you're like, you know, you're kind of messing things up a little bit. Let's get back to basics. Yeah, if it's not the way you talk. It was so interesting for me when I was recording the audio book of transformational speaking because we write in a different way, and I'm embarrassed to tell you how many times I stopped and said to the director and the tech, oops. I wrote a word that I don't know how to pronounce. (laughs) And so we'd look it up so I'd know how to Mm -hmm. pronounce it. And so when we write, it comes out in a different way. Even when we're preparing an introduction for someone to introduce us, we better read it first and make sure it's conversational. Mm -hmm. The way we write is not the way we speak which is why scripting is so deadly and puts up that wall you mentioned that Mm -hmm. keeps people from being connected with us. So we all have pretty good vocabularies, even though we continue to use the same words. And they work. They work in our daily life. Why would they not work from the speaking platform? Gertrude Stein said, no one real is boring. My company's called Real Speaking because when we're real, we're not boring. Now, it must be very exciting for you to work with people and watch them not only build confidence in their ability to get in front of people and speak, but at the same time to realize that uh, that they have a lot inside of them that has value. They actually become the light. Talk about that transformation there because it's very exciting when you see people uh, begin to realize that that everything inside of them isn't as worthless as they think it is. It's so interesting because I work with people for three and a half days in real speaking, only six people. And they say, how do I prepare? And I say, come as you are and be willing to show up and explore. First of all, we don't know our best material. We tend to work with things that are tried and true, and often that means old and boring. And we're living, growing, expanding human beings with new stories and new ideas all the time that can flow through us. 
So what I do is give people lots of exercises and space to see themselves talk about what's up in the moment and when they hit emotion to really look at what's up and what's underneath that and the greatest new stories and material emerges. And what they see in the small group is that when they're real and they're into what has real heart and meaning for them, people are spellbound. We hear the blah, 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 ginger, as uh, Gary Larson said, what does your dog hear when you speak? It's pretty much what the audience hears when we speak, the blah, 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 blah. And But when we get into the story that we care deeply about, either the story that holds our message that we want to deliver or the new story that we see as possible, going back to to why Obama was so effective, then there's a confidence that I see come through people and an excitement about communicating that they may never have had before. So we don't develop a presentation until the last evening so it can all start finding form and integrate the learning of the three days. And it, yes, it's exciting. And the other beautiful thing for me is the kinds of people I attract. And I learn so much. I learn so much about different fields and points of view. And it's always a stunning change from how someone comes in and how they leave and their excitement about their ability to influence others. Mm-hmm. Now, Gail, when you're uh, as you're talking with uh, our audience today, I guess pretty much anybody, if they've ever had an inkling to get into public speaking, and maybe even potentially this is something you can even earn an extra income doing, how do they get started? What are some recommendations besides obviously picking up transformational speaking? Uh, would you suggest that they get started? You know, m- Any town we live in has groups that meet regularly, whether they're um, civic groups or professional groups. I think you could go to your chamber of commerce and look at all the people who are meeting and say, wow, they might be really interested in my message. First, we have to know what I call our original medicine. It's an indigenous term that we all have gifts and talents nowhere else duplicated. We have to believe that about ourselves. And then we have a message that is ours to deliver. And when we know our medicine and our message, then we really can simplify all the choices about where we're going to show up to speak. Because if they're not interested in that, why would you? That's why why you'd get be afraid of speaking. They're not interested and you can't reach them. That would develop a lot of fear very quickly. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people who want to hear from us where we can share our stories and our understandings in powerful ways. So it can be as simple as looking at your own civic groups, your faith groups, your professional groups, your neighborhoods, and see where people gather. And that's how we really get to hone our skills. I recommend when someone hears, boy, that was great, I learned so much, that we get really specific and say, what was it that touched you? Because we start getting feedback about the stories or the content that we're using that is meaningful to people, and then we can build more of that in. Mm -hmm. So we do start creating something that holds a lot of juice for an audience, and then we can go out and start charging money for it. For example, keynoting is very competitive, and it's changing a lot, too, in the the pullback on budgets for speakers. Mm -hmm. So they're wanting real content. But workshops are evergreen. If you find, if you work within an industry, for example, and you have the right workshop for them, for their conventions or regional meetings, you can go back year after year but the keynote are they're only wanting once because that's to build attendance. So there's so many speaking opportunities that aren't the high-paid keynoter for whom there's a lot of pressure. If anyone wants to go to my website at realspeaking.net, there's an e-letter there about what it takes to be a keynoter. Mm-hmm. I wrote it in response to an AOL talking about the most overpaid jobs. 
<laughs> and I said, you know, for those who do it well, they earn every dime of that. Oh, you better believe they do. And so I wrote an e-letter on what it takes to be. It's an art form. Keynoting is an art form because it truly is an art form. And it, the whole meeting depends on someone doing their job really well. And part of that job is making it look easy. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, uh, when you think about stand-up comics, as I was growing up in high school, I used to enjoy late in the evening watching Evening at the Improv. And I thought to myself, as you watch these comedians, I could do that. you know. And I literally believed that they were ad-libbing. So in my senior year of high school, the speech coach approaches me after I had done some stand-up comedy in my junior year at an assembly that we had. He says, you really need to be on the speech team. And it was funny because I was thinking speech club was for kids who had impediments. You know, they just couldn't speak well. Oh. I, I didn't realize <laughs> that it was actually, you know, eggheads, if you will, you know, the smart kids in the school that were going out and giving speeches. And I thought, oh, that's what this is. So he says, this is a speech that I think you'd do really well in, which was after dinner speaking. And I thought, okay, so this is basically comedy with a serious undertone or a point that you toast to. And I got out and I started doing that, and here I was just killing the audience. Then the coach uh-huh. comes up and he says, so where's your speech? And I said, what do you mean, where's my speech? He says, don't you have a written speech somewhere? And I said, well, no. And he says, do you think these co- co- you know, comics just get up there and they just tell jokes? And I thought that's what they did. So that's what I was doing. I think and we, so I, we I, think that if we don't, someone doesn't tell us otherwise. It's one of the greatest myths. Uh-huh. And the point of the mm-hmm. story was the fact that I started to write the speeches and practice them, as he said. I wasn't funny anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, this ain't working, and I'm not winning. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and go back to doing it my way. Yeah, you know? so, you, so your medicine was clearly your sense of humor mm-hmm. and capacity to connect with people using humor. Mm-hmm. What was missing was the me- was the message. You know, mm-hmm. what was the because. After dinner speaking, they they don't call they don't call it comedy. They call it humorist, right? Which is humor with a message. Mm-hmm. So there's got to be the message, and then I never, as as I spoke earlier, don't write it out because you don't write the way you speak. You storyboard board it. You use sticky notes, and you start forming your thoughts on sticky notes that you can move around. And then it starts hanging together, and you can be natural in your expression with words that mm-hmm. that sort of inspire, oh, that's where I'm going next, and keep you on track. But you can still be spontaneous within that structure. It's I know so one of the easier. other, uh, I was going to say, Gail, one of the other little things, too, that I think people will notice as they watch people giving speeches is their body language. And you get some people up there that flail their hands like they're falling off of a tightrope. And it's like, can you slow those hands down a little bit? But then you find others who work a room very well with hand and facial expressions. And I know that you talk about body posture, that that's one important element also as well in connecting with the audience. Well, I think the body informs us really well. And I haven't worked with too many people who are over the top that we've had to calm them down. Usually it's they feel like they're too big if they gesture at all. But what happens when you relive instead of retell is your body supports you and it does become natural and you're not thinking about it. So it's another reason for not trying to look at it as a rehearsal, but to show up and be present with with that story as though it were happening right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now as a person is nervous and they get up on stage perhaps for the first time, what are some suggestions you could make for a person to sort of calm down and just get into the moment and deliver their story or their speech? Well, Fritz Perl says, fear is excitement without the breath. Mm -hmm. So I had a client who was head of the Pranayama Institute, which is about breath, and I said, would you write some techniques for calming yourself through breath before speaking? And they're free on my website at realspeaking.net. They're also in transformational speaking. But here's the simplest one. It's this, 
out breath many times till you feel yourself moving down into your belly instead of being up in your head with your nerves. It's such a good one. I had someone come to work with me who said, I'm either going to cancel this speech next week or I'm going to get over it. And she told she she did an amazing presentation. When she showed up, she went into the bathroom and she was in that stall going, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> and she said that speaking is now her best way of building her interior redesign business. You know, most people who are building business, people work with us because they like us or they feel like they're safe with us or that it would be fun or whatever reason that we have the competence. So brochures, listings, advertising, nothing is as important as the human connection. So for anyone who's wanting to let people know about how they serve the world and and to build clients, speaking is amazing Mm -hmm. because you can line up like a barcode with the right people for you. We think we need so much business, but the truth is we just need the right business for us. There's plenty of opportunity. You know, Gail, that's a very important point, especially for boomers out there listening, and they've started a business. A lot of them are starting to, say, fire their bosses, and they're wondering, how do I drum up new business? And you realize speaking in public, doing events as a speaker, is one of the greatest ways you can excuse me, do that because you can then become an expert in your field in such a way through speaking and education that people naturally want to come to you because they trust in what it is you say. Mm-hmm. You know, and examples of that, obviously, if you want to get to, say, the metaphysics, you you take a look at uh, people, like you said earlier, Deepak Chopra, or, you know, there's Bernie Siegel and the like, and they're out, they're out selling basically information, but they become experts through their public speaking events and that's why people trust the work that they actually put out there. It works. You know, you're talking about people who are celebrities at this point where they could likely clear their throat and get a standing ovation. <laughs> for anyone who isn't, you know, who doesn't have that high profile. And actually, I met Deepak before he did, and he said, you know, I don't know how to get past this $1,500 mark. And mm. we were getting ready to, to look at that and work together. This was must have been um, mid-80s. Right. And then he went on Oprah, and the rest is history. I mean, it hit. And what I've noticed about Deepak over the years that I have enjoyed so much is the more successful he gets, the more fun he has. Mm -hmm. He is so festive and playful now, where before it was very scientific. And he still does the science, and he still does the metaphysics so well, but he has fun. And I enjoy that so much. I, he was hosting a book signing in New York for Laura Day, who had written about intuition. And it was a, at a cigar bar. It was quite an interesting book event because it was hosted by Demi Moore and Donna Karen and Deepak Chopra at a cigar bar. And a friend of mine was with uh, Random House, and we went to this. And I watched Deepak sitting there in this planter, really, where his throngs of people lined up to introduce themselves. And as I watched him, Daniel, he was so present. This man was completely there. Mm -hmm. You know, each person was an individual. Those eyes, he was with them 100%. And so when I got up to him, you know, six or seven people later, I reminded him of our meeting many years before, and he was so generous in his recollection of that. And I said, you know what, Deepak, I'd heard you'd gone Hollywood, but what I'm seeing is you've had a lot more influence on them than they have on you. And you could tell it by the quality of his presence. He wasn't distracted. He wasn't being somewhere else. He was there with each person. Such a gift. Well, that was what I was just thinking, too, because as we were talking earlier about that stage fright that a person has as they're about to get up on stage, and you recommended the way that you just kind of, the fear is the excitement without the breath, and, and that's so true that, that that breathing exercise could help calm you into the audience. And 
at the same time I was thinking about the Marsha Brady technique. You familiar with that one? No, tell me. Okay, if you remember the series The Brady Bunch, Mm -hmm. there was somebody that said the way that you can actually connect with your audience and relax is just pretend that they're all in their underwear. (laughs) Now, I'll tell you from a personal experience, I don't know that that really works because I actually, believe it or not, had a time that I went out to a nudist society event, and I had to speak to almost 40 people (laughs) <laughs> and none of them were wearing their underwear. And I can truly tell you that was one of the most surreal experiences <laughs> I ever had as a public speaker. But I calmed into the event, and I connected with them as I would with an audience that had all their clothes on. <laughs> but uh, it took my public speaking to a whole new level. I bet it <laughs> And, you know... <laughs> But the point I was going to make, if I could make a suggestion, and I'm sure that it's in your book, is that one of the things in, in projecting to your audience is that as you get out and you speak to them, make eye contact with people, and you'll realize that even a hall with two or 3,000 people can feel like you've reduced it down to just a couple of people. It can, and yeah. you become very comfortable. Yeah, because there's usually, you know, there's a lot of people who do like you and don't tell their face, and you don't want to be looking at them. Right. But usually there's a few people at different spots in the room who you get are totally with you. And it's so good to let yourself enjoy that energy and speak to them because I think then we go deeper rather than backing off. I think what happens if we think they aren't with us, we don't bring our full gift forward. Well, they can't Mm -hmm. handle it or... Would that be over the top? And then we're not present because we're doing that mind talk thing. Mm -hmm. You know, another technique, I don't like the underwear one, but... (laughs) (laughs) But like I said, that was the Marsha Brady (laughs) technique, and I don't think it works too well, (laughs) especially if you don't like the color of the underwear somebody's wearing, I guess. But, but uh, you know, our connection with nature is a lot... The reason a lot of people are speaking right now, and one very simple way is to just feel those like you have roots of a tree coming out from your your spine that are rooting you deeply into the center of the earth. And that gets the energy down. You know, the, pro- the problem is it's in our head, and, and the head talk is keeping us from being present, and it's making us nervous. Mm-hmm. But if we can move down into our body and feel that centeredness, it makes all the difference. I do an exercise with people when they're in their head with a partner, just trying to lift them or move them from behind. And, you know, you can it's not a weightlifting feat. There's just nothing there grounding them. And then we do a visualization of that, you know, whatever. It could be a rope tethering you to the center of the earth, or I like the tree trunk one for myself. And once they feel themselves there, their partner tries to move them again, and they are immovable. And they really get that felt sense in the body that there's a lot to this. Getting out of, you know, once we've done our prep, Daniel, you know, your high school after dinner speaking notwithstanding, when we do our prep, then we just have to step back. I always say I step back and let spirit lead the way because what wants to be said through us that can be valuable to someone else, if we're centered and if we're connected, can come out in an unexpected way and be exactly what that audience needs. Mm -hmm. That's what I was explaining also to my wife about that connection you have with an audience is that there's an energy exchange. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really it gets to a point that even if you didn't get paid for your speeches, what you get out of it is quite amazing. It is. It is. It's a wonderful experience. I was watching something online the other day that's probably gone around about this man who's an orchestra conductor who was in front of a group coaching a 15-year-old cellist. And the kid was good and okay, and then he helped him be great. And I was kind of tracking it with, oh, what's he doing that I would do with a speaker? But at the end, he said that whenever Bach composed a piece, he would always say something at the end or for the glory of God or something like that. And he said what that means is that when you do something well, 
It's an acknowledgement that what you have done is allowed people to touch something in themselves they would not have touched otherwise. And when that happens, there's this connection we're all so hungry for to be aligned with others and feeling like we're on the same page and part of the same humanity and that then we can move forward together. So it's really rich. And if, if speaking is done as an ego exercise, I imagine it's a pretty lonely trip. I mean, can you imagine going out, getting your standing ovation, going back to your hotel room where you have to be your own hero with nobody to talk to who doesn't know the miracle you just performed? (laughs) Right. It's not an easy lifestyle. No. No, that indeed it isn't. (laughs) And, you know, don't you love it? With Internet radio and with publishing and with all the communications possible now there's so many ways we can be heard Mm -hmm. and if we just get really clear about how life wants to speak to us and how we can make a difference it really matters it reminds me of a quote that i read from a marianne williamson book and this is so true in public speaking or when you're out there doing as you're describing is that you be the light that way you automatically allow others to do the same. Mm -hmm. And this is that opportunity that you be that light because it allows others to do the same thing Mm -hmm. through your inspiration. And that's where you see the rewards of just doing something like this, even if it's just a hobby alone, will fulfill you in ways that even money can't even do. Absolutely. And it lets you, it's kind of like a get out of jail free card with her poem that she said, she said, when you are liberated from your own fear, Mm -hmm your presence automatically liberates others. Exactly. And it's so beautiful because you feel, we can think that as speakers, well, we're supposed to be perfect. I mean, we're just other people working through the same issues. And what we're wanting to do is is show that tender shared humanity and we're all in this together. And if we wait till it's perfect, we're not touchable. It's like, well, that's good for him. But, hey, I'm this poor, depressed slob that could barely get out of bed today. Right. And so we don't want people to say, he's a good speaker, she's a good speaker. Transformational speaking is, wow, that made a difference. I'm going to have a new conversation with people about this. Or I'm going to really take this in and maybe start doing something different. Otherwise, it's just like a rock star, you know. You have this feel-good experience, and you go home, and maybe you hum a few bars the next day, but it's over. Right. And you say, oh, gosh, it was great to be there, but, you know, so what? (laughs) I got the (laughs) (laughs) T-shirt. What we want is the inspired action that comes from our speaking that makes it so real for someone that they actually do something different. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what the world's calling for. And I think beyond 50, it's such a, it's, it's such a great age, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like I went to this amazing film last night about the life of Rachel, or, or interviews with Rachel Carson, who wrote The Silent Spring back in the 60s, about the um, DDT poisoning. Mm-hmm. And, oh, my goodness, it was so inspiring. And she said... In some ways, the subject chooses the writer. And she was writing us in because she didn't want she wanted to write something about nature and children. She didn't want to write about the devastation of our environment. But you know, the whole all the Kennedy the, uh, initiatives on the Clean Air Act and everything came out of her having the courage to put that out. Mm-hmm. And she she was in the she was there talking to the camera and saying she had to write a speech and that one of the wonderful things about getting older is that you're really able to state clearly what it is you believe in and why. So you know, younger, where you know, I say to many of my clients, we spend the first part of our life trying to fit in. And now it's time to stand out. We have a distinctive life experience. We have something to say. And it's something that only each person has their own thing to say because we have this 
configuration of gifts and talents and life experience that is nowhere else duplicated. And if we don't share it, nobody else can or will. Mm-hmm. So we're, I think it's an uh, uh, imperative to speak out now. And our subject often finds us. Well, I'll tell you, it's been a real pleasure to have you on our program today. The book is Transformational Speaking. If you want to change the world, tell a better story. And Gail Larson, thank you for being on the program. I'd encourage you to go ahead and give your website out again. It's Real Speaking, www.realspeaking.net. And Transformational Speaking, if you want to change the world, tell a better story. You can order from bookstores everywhere. It's also an audio book. And... I invite comments and feedback and hearing from people because it's such a joy to be part of inspiring a better world. It certainly is. I'm glad we're doing the work we were meant to be doing. (laughs) Mm, Well, it certainly sounds that you are, Daniel. Thank you so much for inviting me to be your guest today. You get. Thank you very much. Many blessings to you. You bet. Transformational Speaking is the book. Our guest today, Gail Larson. We also want to thank you, the audience out there, for tuning in today and listening to our program. You can find out more about us by visiting us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That's the number 50 with a 5-0, beyond50radio.com. And also sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. Also be sure to visit us at our blog where we post all of our archived shows and information, event information, and resources as well. We also want to thank one of the following sponsors for making this program possible. That is ZRT Laboratory. So if you are suffering from hot flashes, foggy thinking, sudden weight gain, low libido, mood swings, and other effects of aging, ZRT Laboratory, the forerunner and hormone testing, is your first step toward ending those troublesome symptoms. Visit them online at www.zrtlab.com. To find out how their home collection kits can help detect and correct hidden hormone imbalances. Let testing be your guide to symptom relief and life-changing solutions that begin with you. And remember, physician's guidance is recommended. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>